Welcome. I'm Stephen Winnick of the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. For many years, we've presented the Homegrown Concert Series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world. In the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call Homegrown at Home. So 2021 was our second year of Homegrown at Home concerts. It's now early 2022, and we are doing interviews with the artists who performed in the Homegrown at Home 2021 series. And we decided in this case, we should also interview John Graham, an ethnomusicologist and historical musicologist who facilitated the concert of the Ranina Quartet from the country of Georgia, and who also participated in their video concert as a cultural interpreter for our American audiences. John is a scholar, an entrepreneur, a traveler, and a teacher. He lives in Tbilisi, Georgia with his wife and children, but he keeps close ties with family and friends here in the United States. Um, he does sing uh, in a church choir there, and he supports local musicians and NGOs with his voice in the Georgian community, and he regularly travels in Georgia as well. Um, he holds uh, degrees in ethnomusicology and historical musicology, including a PhD from Princeton. He's received several prestigious awards and grants in both countries, including a Fulbright research grant from the US, and he's taught at prestigious universities, including Yale. He's an active facilitator of cultural exchange, and he organizes performance tours in the United States for Georgian ensembles. And in particular, he's been involved with several concerts here at the Library of Congress. Um, he regularly lectures on uh, topics related to Georgian music, and he also gives practical workshops on Georgian folk and sacred music. Uh, he currently also directs his own cultural tourism business, John Graham Tours. So all of those things are the, the sort of activities of our guest, John Graham. So welcome, John. Thank you so much. And I'm also going to introduce Theodosia Austin, who is the coordinator of public events for the American Folklife Center. Thea is our staff specialist in the area of Georgian culture and she is also the main organizer and producer of the concert series itself. So the secret is that she's actually at all of these video interviews too, but she mostly stays backstage. But today she is joining us on camera. So welcome, Thea. Hello. All right, well, we can get started with asking John some pertinent questions about Georgian music and his involvement. Okay, well, John, you know, why don't you tell us about a little bit about how you became interested in traditional Georgian chant. I know you went to Wesleyan and um, I think you have a very special story about Shen Harvanahi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thea. Oh, it's wonderful to be in an interview context with you hosting. Thank you so much. And to you as well, Steve, thank you for that long introduction. Uh, well, I first became involved in Georgian music or first learned about Georgian music back in 2002. I was an undergraduate student at Wesleyan University and I was looking for a topic for my senior project and researching different kinds of sacred music, which was uh, the focus of my music major at the time. But I was also very much a, a traveler and wanted to travel the world, living in monasteries and studying music and different religions. Those were my passions back then. And um, so in researching various world sacred music traditions in the library, I came across a CD uh, by the Rustavi Ensemble, this, the Georgian State Ensemble since the 1950s. They have many incredible albums um, from the Soviet era on the Melodia label and later on CD. And that particular one was from um, 1996. It was called Georgian Voices and the first track or uh, one of the first tracks there is Tsmindal Merto, which is a, a chant called Holy God, the Trisagion hymn. And one of the next chants is Shen Harvanachi, the one you just mentioned, uh, Thea. And these two chants really struck a chord with me. I immediately transcribed them after listening to the chants many times and took them to a choir that I had formed to do my senior recital on Gregorian chant. Uh, and I always tell the joke that um, after a couple of weeks of rehearsing Georgian chant together with Gregorian, we decided to just abandon Gregorian and focus on Georgian. My advisors never even noticed the difference. Uh, that's of course not true. 
they were thrilled that I had discovered something that was uh, unique and interesting and, and that I was passionate about. And at that time, as an undergraduate, I didn't feel like I had a real contribution to make in, in a performative or scholarly way to the Gregorian chant tradition, which is, of course, the medieval music of the, of the Western Catholic Church. I love that repertory, and I, I do hold my musical roots in that repertory, uh, as well as the Anglican tradition, which I was raised in. But in becoming passionate at that time about a new polyphonic sacred music tradition that I really changed the course of my own personal story and uh, professional trajectory in life with that decision. Uh, and for the rest of the year, we studied Georgian three-part harmony, and uh, we did several performances at Westland. And after I graduated, I decided to come to Georgia. That was in the summer of 2003. Mm -hmm. And, and how, how did that come about? How was that move for you going to Georgia for the first time? Well, it's a very different world here. Uh, I had traveled quite a bit around the world, but I had never heard of Georgia or knew, I didn't know anything about it before uh, falling in love with the music. I had never studied the, um, the cultural history of the Caucasus region, which is absolutely fascinating. I didn't know anything about the languages here in this part of the world, which are non-Indo-European languages. Uh, they, they write and they have a literature in their own alphabet, not just one, three different alphabets from the medieval and early um, Christian period. So there was so much to learn here. And the geography is absolutely stunning. The, the Great Caucasus Mountains, they're higher than the Alps or the Sierras. And every single valley system seems to ho hold its own culture with its own uh, diverse uh, languages and cuisines and, and music systems. So it was a great place to land uh, as a young adventurer, someone with a focus on music. And, and that uh, turned out to be a perfect inroad into Georgian culture because polyphony and polyphonic singing is something that's very strong and very deep for Georgian identity. And anyone that comes to Georgia as someone interested in something that's important to the people here uh, receives an open door, a red carpet, and, and folks here are very friendly, especially to anyone that takes an interest in their culture. So how did you, I, I have to just add that Smindal Humerto, that recording of the Rustavi Ensemble changed my life. <laughs> I, I, there I was a share that in common. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not, not alone. The two of us and many other people. That's there's something extraordinary about those recordings. Yeah, they really are. Well, so how did you plug into the community of traditional singers when you first got there to Georgia? Well, uh, I joined a small group of, of Americans and Brits, and we studied folk music in the town of Signagi for two weeks under a program that had been organized by the Village Harmony uh, mm -hmm. organization from the United States. And so we studied with local singers and we had meals together with those singers. And so there were rehearsal times and then there were the, the feasting times where the singing would continue. And there were also field trips to visit other singers and other interesting uh, cultural sites in the area like medieval churches and castles and national parks. Uh, and then after that two week tour, I stayed for three months to study Georgian language. Uh, and then um, when I went back the following year with a Fulbright grant, that grant was specifically to study the manuscripts of the, uh, that record the sacred music tradition. So that project happened in Tbilisi and I was much more active in seeking out everybody that was involved in traditional music from conservatory professors and students to the, the archives in the, at the manuscript center. And there's a, a a ministry of culture here with a, a folklore center and division. So I was also lucky that that fall when I started the Fulbright in 2004, there was a symposium for traditional polyphony. And it was a relatively new initiative by uh, the leading members of the, the cultural sphere here in Tbilisi. But they had attracted a lot of international attention and interest. So there were many uh, international choirs that came to Tbilisi and, and international scholars. 
And everyone came together at the same time about one month after I started my project. So that was a great, great place to meet everybody all in all at the same time in, in September 2004. I'll never remember, I'll never forget rather, many of the meetings, the critical meetings that I made at that time, including with the Anshishati Ensemble and with uh, Lur Sab Togonidze, who I ended up uh, doing an important translation together with him that led to towards my dissertation work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that must have been magical. I mean, really so many synchronicities and, and coming together. Yeah. And and ultimately, of course, I think it's fair to say it. this also changed your life. I mean, big seismic life changes eventually followed, including, you know, marriage and conversion. Can you talk about that process a little bit about sort of becoming more of an insider in Georgian culture or moving toward living there? I would be happy to. Yeah, it was. Um, well, the conversion story, I, I had grown up uh, in various Protestant contexts. So I'd been baptized in the Christian community, with a, which is a small group of, of followers of the teachings of Rudolf Steiner and his anthroposophical movement. Sure. My parents were uh, devotees of Rudolf Steiner and, and career Waldorf teachers, and that was the educational system that I'd been raised in. But it doesn't raise people to be uh, particularly acolytes of that religion. Rather, it, many people raised in that church or in that philosophical system end up going abroad or uh, seeking or other sorts of traditions and reaching out for, uh, to find their own path. So it's really about teaching the human being to be self-actualized and make important decisions for themselves. So many of my friends have have joined various other uh, paths, whether they be religious or, or agnostic, let's say, but they all have strong beliefs in one way or the other. My path uh, led me towards uh, religious exploration. I, I studied Buddhism. I studied many Protestant, early American Protestant religions. Uh, I was interested in, uh, in shamanism and Native American uh, religion. And, um, but my roots were in uh, Christianity and uh, and I also grew up in a boys choir in a high Episcopalian church in the in Valley Forge Memorial Chapel in, in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. So this was an introduction into say the high Anglican practice of uh, basically Catholic liturgy. So coming to Georgia where it's Orthodox Christian, uh, the, this type of um, deep ritual experience was familiar to me from those boy choir days. Uh, meanwhile, the, the deepness of the prayer and the belief of the parishioners was what struck me the most. People really take their beliefs seriously. They pray every day, morning and night, before eating, before traveling. They pray for their family members, for their friends. And when they enter sacred spaces, they enter with a sense of reverence. And somehow this was unique and different to me. Of course, I was under the spell of being in medieval stone cathedrals and singing Georgian polyphonic music and uh, being around, uh, you know, new culture and, and, uh, and new language and all backdrop by the Caucasus Mountains. It's very impressionable. Uh, I'm not the first to, to <laughs> fall under the impressions here. So I converted to Georgian Orthodox Christianity in February 2005. And uh, it's a decision that I'll never regret. I basically allowed Orthodoxy to come into my life. It doesn't mean that uh, I am a strong advocate or, or let's say proselytizer for Orthodox Christian social values. I still have my own culture and my own social values, but uh, I have been blessed to meet many amazing people in the Orthodox Church, and and I try and do my best uh, to be a, an active member of the Church in the ways that I can. Great, and then thank in you. Terms of your, the second part of your question you, was yeah, yeah, the <laughs> more personally, or you know, more more on the personal side, yeah. So that happened several years later. I, I met my wife um, through the conservatory circles. We got engaged in 2010 and married in 2011. At first we lived in, she's also um, a musicologist with a PhD in, uh, in music history. 
and she's a wonderful singer and pianist. Uh, for the first four years of our lives, we lived in the United States while I was finishing up uh, my PhD work and, and doing some postdoc teaching. Uh, and then in recent years, we've been back here in uh, Georgia. My wife finished her PhD and we've, we've had several children and now I've been uh, working mostly with my travel business uh, and also being an advocate for many of the, the choir trips that I organize. Uh, at the same time, both my wife and I are involved in a lot of academic projects, but not as our, our main source of income. I, I remember one of the first times you came to the library was 2005 with the Anches Khati Ensemble. So not long after, after that momentous year, that was one of that was still uh, one of the best overviews of Georgian um, tr traditional folk songs. I think that you can find on um, on the web. It's it's a webcast on the library's website with Malchaz. Um, well, and actually the entire choir there talking about the different, you know, an overview of the styles. But um, it's one thing, um, you know, to become part of the culture, but it's another step to decide to get a PhD. So how did you decide to do, you know, to take that step? That's a big step. Yes. Uh, thank you for that question. And also for that memory coming to the Library of Congress 2005, that was with the Anshishkati Church Choir. And that experience of working with them really galvanized my interest, not just as a passion to sing Georgian music and, uh, and be a student, but uh, galvanized my idea that perhaps this could be a career path and that perhaps I could professionalize this interest by uh, returning to graduate school um, and then being putting me in a position perhaps to be a better advocate, a better bridge uh, for this music between Georgia and the West and, and back and forth, which is which had become one of my main ideas for why I, I wanted to continue pursuing this, uh, this passion. So that trip came about um, during the Fulbright year. There, was, there were so many amazing singers here in Georgia, and it was a really momentous time because the manuscripts that recorded Georgian sacred music, which were written in the 1880s and 1890s, had been secreted away in Soviet archives for almost the entire 20th century, but had been recently discovered by members of this ensemble, the Anchiskati Ensemble. So they were in the process of singing those chants, putting out a number of CD recordings, and also publishing, editing and publishing those chants in small uh, collections. And there was a series of books that were coming out. I think volume two had come out right then in 2004. Now we're at volume eight, and uh, I've been the English language editor, fortunately, on the on this uh, these series of books, and they're very important. It's it's what everyone sings from now in all of the Georgian Orthodox churches throughout the world, um, and this choir had a big role in popularizing this uh, this former repertory, which had once been an oral tradition, but had gone out of practice in, under Soviet suppression and was being revived by the Anchishati Ensemble. So I thought it was really important to share their work, not just their incredible voices and their music, but also their musicological work with the world. And that's why we, uh, together with the team, we, we organized that tour to the United States. We had about 25 concerts in five weeks uh, in October 2005. And one of the important ones was at the Library of Congress, I think precisely because, Thea, you were involved in helping us uh, record that pre-concert lecture. And that was, a, that's, that was part of the mission, was not just to perform, but also to educate and to help popularize and to help bridge the knowledge that these the members of this ensemble had, contained, hold within them to prospective audiences, not just those in the room, but to all the future scholars and interested performers that will come after we are not here anymore. So that's the idea. The oral tradition may have been severed, but now we're reviving it. And in the future, the, this, will, this incredible musical tradition will be reborn. We were incredibly lucky that you were brought over these leading 
researchers and singers to to give us an overview of of traditional singing it, it was such a wealth of scholarly knowledge and talent in the library it was it was such an honor to be able to record that concert i remember a funny si side note was that because it was 2005 and this the capital was undergoing all of these um new security measures we weren't able to allow them to bring their daggers in and <laughs> And That's this, right. They had the traditional costumes on that, that included, you know, twelve-inch long daggers. That's right. The and they were not happy. <laughs> and I, I was I'm so sorry about that because I love their chokers. Like but that was that was an incredible opportunity that you brought us, and um, they're wonderful, wonderful people that I've had a chance to meet, you know, a, a, again and again several times. But so thank you. We're really indebted. And we're really happy to have that um, that video, as Thea said, on the library's website as well, because both the videos, the lecture and the performance itself, because it really does um, sort of, uh, you know, help to spread the word about this tradition, which was really important at that time and continues to be important because of one of the things that you talked about and that you had to deal with in your PhD, which was <clears throat> the repression of chant first by the Russian Empire and then by the Soviets. Um, could you talk about that repression a little bit, just so we get the context of all of this? Yeah, I, I thank you for bringing me back. I, I sidestepped the question about the dissertation because it's it's too big of a topic to, re <laughs> <laughs> to summarize, of course. Uh, but, you know, let's see, where to begin with the repressions of the chant. It really started when, um, uh, like I said, it was an oral tradition, and that gave it flexibility to survive despite the long uh, war-torn history in Georgia of many invasions coming from uh, mostly from the, the southeast, the various Persian empires always considered the Caucasus region to be part of their periphery and an important place to bring under their control. And then uh, in the last thousand years, there's been the Turkish presence in Anatolia to the southwest, immediately to the southwest of Georgia. And they also considered the Caucasus to be part of their, their general uh, empire, especially during the, the three, 400 years of Ottoman imperial rule. Uh, so, and at, at various times, the Turks were fighting the Persians in Georgia. Now, before them, of course, there were Byzantines, there were Romans, there were Scythians, you know, many different uh, major groups have considered the Caucasus a battleground. Uh, and, but throughout all of this history, their Georgians were able to maintain their culture by remaining flexible. And the oral tradition allows for that. And you see this in oral traditions around the world. Uh, there were certain core tenets to the tradition which had to be preserved. So in the case of Georgian polyphony, that meant little snippets of model melodies which are sung by the top voice. And then there are other elements of the tradition which can be improvised around those core elements. And they should be improvised. That makes the core elements stronger and, and less malleable and less uh, changeable because everyone's improvising around an accepted group of rules, like jazz song being improvised around a set of uh, a progression of chords and an established melody. Same principles here. So this oral tradition was resilient and robust and, and persevered in various monastic centers throughout Georgia, the Georgian medieval ages. The scholars think that it, it goes back to uh, the seventh, eighth, ninth centuries, you know, when Christian melodies were coming into Georgia, but it quickly vernacularized into the local three-part harmony folk tradition. And, and so the sacred music was also sung in three-part harmony. So um, re active repression of this music doesn't start until the Russian empire arrives in 1801. And their mission was not so much to uh, conquer and destroy and kill. It was rather to incorporate the various peoples at the periphery into their empire and to make them 
imperial citizens uh, and to, to Russify them uh, both linguistically and culturally and religiously. So the Russian Orthodox Church took over the Georgian Orthodox Church, banned the patriarch uh, in 1810, um, basically sent all of the Georgian bishops into exile in a desert monastery at Davi Kareji and placed pro-Russian bishops in charge of uh, the few remaining um, coalesced dioceses. So before there were 35 dioceses in Georgia, and the Russians made five dioceses, put pro-Russian bishops in charge, and that's how they were able to control uh, the church. And in a religious country, that was a major uh, engine of social power. They also controlled the institutions like the various seminaries and um, and put, pro, uh, put Russian singers in those seminaries to teach Slavonic chant. Now, there were some Russian appointed exarchs or head of the Russian churches who were fascinated with Georgian culture, the frescoes, the architecture, the music, but they were very few. Of the many Russian exarchs that came throughout the 1800s, most of them were anti-Georgian, pro-Russian, and therefore the oral tradition of Georgian chant went into steep decline. Between 1801 and the time when the first chant was written down uh, or when the first major project started in 1884, uh, there went, there were in 1801, if there were thousands, maybe two, 3,000 master chanters, by the 1880s, there were less than 10 in the whole yeah. country. And by master chanter, I mean not just people that sing in church. I mean someone who was a master of the oral tradition. That's all they did. They had been trained in that, and that's what was their profession. And it was it signaled someone who was very intelligent, knew at least three thousand melodies by heart, knew how to harmonize them in three part harmony, uh, knew how to ornament all three voice parts, and knew how to teach that to a new generation. Uh, so these are, these were the master chanters, and there were very few by the time that this tradition uh, was written down into European Western notation in the 1880s. And the Karbalashvili brothers were um, sounds like half of <laughs> half of that. I mean, there were five brothers, right? That's right. That's right. And they you know they they wouldn't even say that they were master chanters. Their father and their grandfather had been, but no one was able to record their father or grandfather in notation. So these brothers who inherited their musical tradition through their uh, through their father, who was a priest, and likewise, they were all priests, uh, they had to do a bit of self-education. Uh, Vaso Karbulash really took himself to Moscow to learn European notation specifically yeah. so that he wouldn't have to rely on other people to write down his family chant tradition. He could write it down himself. And his archive is one of the most interesting because we can see his process. We see him write down the first voice, canonical melody. Then he writes the bass part very simply. And then he doodles in the middle voice, creating all of these improvisations, these chants that you and I fell in love with at the very beginning, Thea, they're from the Karbalashvili tradition. Shenkar Venachi, for example, the famous one that we sing, that middle line that sounds like the melody. That's Vasil doodling. You know, he he just imagining that that sort of doodling. The actual melody is the top voice. So that's the melody. But when you add these ornamental lines underneath it, as Fossil was prone to do, and uh, you know, blessing us all with this incredible musical tradition a century later. Uh, he did that with all of the chants in his archive, whereas his brothers were more interested in preserving a simplistic style, and they didn't they didn't ornament the middle voice, and it's mostly just parallel third harmony. So there's a lot of interesting uh, aesthetic choices that were made by the various people working to preserve these traditions, and that gives us a good glimpse into the breadth of the oral tradition and the various ways to manifest it. Any day that you went to church, you might hear the same singer singing it in, a, in an ornamental style or a simple style. Uh, you might be able to hear singers from East Georgia, like the Karbalashvili brothers that we're talking about, or from Central Georgia or from West Georgia or other 
places that whose traditions were never even uh, transcribed in the notation. So it's a very rich musical tradition there. But all, and all just the following. Oh, oh no, but but influenced probably somewhat by the f local folk style. I mean, Gouri and chants f sound different than chants from the east, for instance. Would you say? That's right. The, the Karbalashvili brothers, these priests that we're talking about from East Georgia, who, who lived and worked in, in Tbilisi area in the 1880s, they were also folk singers. They knew many, many folk songs from here. And in their transcriptions, we also have folk songs alongside the chants. Mm -hmm. These two were these two core repertories were inseparable. The same singers singing folk music would sing in the church and vice versa. And the, the singers were always the most important guests at any uh, family gathering, like, a, like someone's birthday or a baptism or uh, important family feast day, etc. cetera. You, would, you had to have singers there. That was a main form of entertainment. So singers were important members of any uh, group or family unit or in the village. If you were a good singer, you were going to be requested at almost every party. So. Uh, these, uh, the Karbalashvili's knew their local folk music and the way that they would improvise on that, the core structure of their oral tradition would be improvised in the manner that they were familiar with in their folk music. So Vasil had such fluidity in writing these doodling uh, ornamented middle lines precisely because that's what happens in East Georgian folk music. The upper voices improvise over a drone in East Georgian folk music. And so the singers are very uh, fluid and flexible and adept at these uh, the long uh, melismatic singing, singing lines. And uh, we can hear that in the folk music for East Georgia. And it, and it also comes into the improvisational elements of the, of the uh, sacred music tradition from the same region. And of course, there were also efforts to record some on, on wax cylinder, weren't there? Yes. Now, the, so in the 1880s, there was active tradition in writing down the notation on paper using a Western European notation, which was a new technology that had come in in the Russian Empire. Uh, you know, that was one of the, the Russians brought many good things to Georgia, uh, including administration, organization of the, the opera house, uh, Western music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but also the recording technology entered around the same time. I think the, there was an English company called the English Gramophone Company, and they arrived into BBC and set up an office in 1902. And their goal was commercial. They wanted to sell these gramophones, uh, the actual machines. But to convince people to buy their machines, they needed to have something good to listen to. So they cast about and asked people, well, what do you want to listen to? And, and there was a, a lot of rural Georgians who were moving out of their villages and moving to the cities at that time. There was a massive urbanization of, in the country. So lots of rural people living in, their, in the cities, working in factories, working jobs and missing home and missing traditions from home. And they wanted to hear folk music. And so that was the reason that these English engineers not trained as ethnomusicologists, mind you. They didn't go out and, and find one or two exemplars from every single repertory and seek out the best singer in every village, you know, much as we would love if they had done that. Rather, they went to one village and recorded 50 songs from whoever they could find, made a couple of, uh, you know, wax cylinders, and then they would later make the shellac discs and uh, sell gramophones. So, these are absolute treasures, and we have to give credit to Anzor Erkomaishvili uh, and his team, who have been active for the last 50 years, tracking down all of the original copies, which were in archives in Moscow and in Berlin, and, and these English gramophone companies' uh, originals were in London, uh, and there, you know, there are some of these recordings in various archives all over the place, and they've been tracked down and and reproduced on cd so now that uh everyone can listen to these early recordings starting in 19, 1902 and up until about 1916 mm, that's when these recordings were made and then after that in the soviet period uh speaking of suppressions uh that was when the real suppression of sacred music came sacred music just couldn't be performed so 
if the previous century had been the Russian Empire trying to Russify the Georgian Orthodox Church, there were still people like the Karbalashvili brothers who were inheriting the oral tradition through their family, even if they couldn't go to a seminary and find any paid Georgian teacher teaching the music because they were all sent home. You could only uh, learn Slavonic chant in any of the seminaries in Georgia during the 1800s. But uh, it was not outlawed to sing sacred chant. And it was, in fact, encouraged. Um, but in the Soviet period, we have a total switch where it becomes cultural policy to suppress anything having to do with the Orthodox Church and uh, with threat of exile. These same singers that had been recorded by the English gramophone company in Ozergeti region in the Goria region on the Black Sea coast, they were threatened in 1934 if we, by authorities that said, if we hear you singing sacred music, it's off to the gulags with you. So they had to sing behind closed doors, making sure that any, uh, any agents weren't nearby or neighbors spying on them. And we have firsthand accounts of their children and grandchildren learning sacred music chants by listening under the door late at night as the adults were humming quietly in the background. And these are firsthand accounts from older people in the 1990s who remembered in the 1920s and 30s, learning these chants by heart, listening under the door. You could just imagine how incredible that was, this, this deep, rich oral tradition, and then having this new authority saying, you're not allowed to sing this music, and we're going to separate your family and destroy your family if you continue to sing this music. But they did so anyway. And the, the kids knew it was so precious to them that they hungered to learn it and memorize it and remembered it their entire lives and continued to perform it in private throughout the Soviet Union so that in the 1990s, an ethnomusicologist could interview such a person and learn this story. That's how the oral tradition hmm. survived just by a hair throughout the Soviet Union, just by a hair. Few people could remember one or two chants and the oral tradition survived in that way. Otherwise, we're completely dependent on those transcriptions that were made in the 1880s. Which, which itself is kind of an, an interesting question, right? So there were written transcriptions, there are, are wax cylinders, and then, of course, there were choral arrangements like Pagliashvili, the, the famous ones. Um, and all of those survived through the, through the Russian period, and then, you know, they exist now after the Soviet period, and they're, they're being used to some extent as the basis for revival. So how do, how do these different kind of documentary forms of uh georgian chant affect what's being done in the revival now and what are the what are the advantages and challenges of, of having those that's a great question steve and it's a big marketplace now which is which i think is a good thing let's say you're a choir director in tbdc uh and in the church if you're a choir director in church you're supposed to sing uh three-part harmony georgian sacred polyphony as inherited through the oral tradition. Okay, so the repertories that were composed in the in the second half of the 20th century after the, the world, after the thaw, which allowed more Orthodox uh, Christian practice after World War II. So there were more people that were able to attend church services, more choirs, and some composers dabbled in composing sacred music in the 1960s and 1970s and so forth. This repertory was still around in the 1990s and, and the early 2000s when I first came here. And now you'd be hard pressed to find it because in most churches now there's a revival of the traditional repertory, the one championed by Anchiskati Church Choir and, and published in, in the eight volumes I was speaking about. And now there's been even more volumes put out in recent years. And uh, the composed repertory is is becoming somewhat lost and perhaps we'll be writing musicology papers about that mm -hmm. in a few years. Meanwhile, there's been, uh, if you're a choir conductor of uh, a non-church choir, but you would like to perform sacred music, there's also a breadth of repertory to choose from. And one of the, one of the main ones is the, uh, uh, there, there's a composer named Zakaria Paliashvili that you mentioned, who composed a mass in Latin, uh, which wasn't published until this year, this past year, 2021, it was finally published. And, but he did publish a second work, which is called the Liturgia, 
Uh, it's basically a mass and it was in Georgian and, uh, and he published that in 1910 and just a few copies. And we don't know if it was ever performed. And then, then the Soviet union came and it was certainly out of favor and, and Palias really had to pivot immediately towards opera and composing songs in favor of, of the Soviet social policy and so forth. Um, so the liturgia was kind of lost, but it was out there. It was a published copy. And uh, one of the major choirs that prom that found this repertory and promoted it is, is the Capitol Hill Chorale. And thanks to Thea and Parker, uh, this, this work became known to the choir and they spent many years performing it, producing a CD and coming to Georgia on tour to perform it here to rave reviews and to, to great influence because now we see a lot of polyester really related projects coming out of that tour, uh, which happened in 2019. So that's a, the, the liturgia is a major work for, uh, it's a, it's a sacred work, but for the stage kind of like the Rachmaninoff All Night Vespers and these other large pieces, large choral works that were in vogue in the uh, turn of the century Moscow where Palios really had studied. So it's a, a 50 minute work and uh, includes lots of different numbers. It's arranged for large chorus, six voices, uh, and uh, it's, it's a fantastically beautiful piece. So that's also available for choir directors to choose from. And then there's all different styles. One can sing in a European choral style. One can sing in a neo-traditionalist uh, style with more of an open throat and folk style. Um, you have small choirs of five singers or you have uh, large choirs of a hundred singers. So it, it's very interesting time musically here in Georgia. Let me also just interject here that John, made this tour of Georgia with the Capitol Hill Chorale possible. And it was unbelievable. It was just absolutely magical every single day. Um, 90 people went. And I have to say that for me, the, the fact that every single person on that, that tour now has a personal relationship with Georgia, I find really exciting. Um, and the fact that we were able to bring Palyashvili home and say, we think this is so beautiful. It, it's yours. We hope that you also think it's beautiful. Um, and one of the most absolutely magical moments for me, and I think for other people too, was <clears throat> the final event at Samtavisi Cathedral, which is the home cathedral of the Karbalashvili brothers. Their, a transcription of their mass was actually the basis of Palyashvili's arrangement of his liturgia, um, John set up a, a musical exchange. It wasn't a performance. He got permission from the bishop for us, the chorale to go and sing this in a church setting, which I think is really special. And it was very unusual and required special permission because it's not church music, it was arranged. But we, but he also brought his own choir and the women's choir, Ioloni, to sing the Karbalashvili transcriptions of their own versions. And so they would sing their the Karbalashvili version, and then we would sing Palyashvili's arrangement. So it was a back and forth. It was a conversation of what was happening a hundred years ago, and. I think um, Dato Shugliashvili was there, one of the le country's leading musicologists, who said that he he felt like he finally understood what Palyashvili was trying to do, you know, add add to this conversation of preservation in a with with the skills that he happened to have, and those skills were were trained in Western conservatories, and yes, they were they were influenced by a, a Russian conservatory, but he was trying to do what he could bring his gifts to the preservation. And I think it that it was something that was rejected for a long time, but, but it was very touching to me, the exchange, the conversation, and that Dato said that he, he understood more about what Palyashvili was trying to do. So that was just, that experience was mystical <laughs> and and it meant it meant absolutely everything to to those of us i think who worked on that project 
So thank you, John, for making that possible because you and your magical powers of <laughs> people and music and, um, and meaning together. That was amazing. It really was the, I, you know, I had a, a, I had the vision of putting it together and I worked for a long time to put it together, but I also have the same experience that you just, just to, described of being a participant in something that was mystical. I, I, that's my memory of it. My memory of it is not at all the difficult logistics of getting everyone into one place at the right same time with the well-fed, with all the permissions in place and all the competing interests. My memory of that, thankfully, is of that mystical experience where a, mu a musical experience where we heard what Paliashvili was hearing in 1900, which were the Karbalashvili brothers singing in their open-throated, strong, full, uh, full-voiced chants with long phrases. They must have had incredible breath support. They were singing since they were small boys and in drone polyphony, and they could sing these long melismatic phrases effortlessly. And we, we heard that from the Georgians. And then we heard Paliashvili's version where he had gone to Moscow, studied with Sergei Tane, have been around Smolensky, Kostalsky, Rachmaninoff, and all these others there. And he knew what European music was. And he'd heard incredible choirs, the Moscow Sonoto Choir, performing this music in great cathedrals in Moscow. That must have been so impressionable for him. So he, Paliashvili wanted to come back, take what he knew of Georgian music. He knew it was valuable, and he wanted to interpret it and make it accessible to the world. And that's precisely what he did with that liturgia. And here we are, 120 years later, Americans and, and other international singers in the chorale singing Paliashvili's vision and hearing its influence from the Georgian singers at the time. I think it was equally powerful for the Georgians to hear the Paliashvili in that context because Paliashvili is only performed in single uh, chants in rarefied stage environments. But here we were in the Karbalashvili church and we were hearing both versions of the same text. Hmm. And, and they're very similar. They're, uh, they're musically cousins. They're, they're like, or you could say a parent and a child, uh, they, you know, so similar. And it, the effect was, as you said, mystical and just gorgeous. We were, we were in the same, that same space, as you said, it was almost like time was collapsed. It was the present and the past at the same time. It was amazing. So thank mm. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, you and know, we've talked quite a bit about the, the liturgical side and the uh, religious music. Um, what are some of the challenges for the transmission of traditional folk music? I mean, we know that liturgical chants were very specifically repressed by the Soviets, but what about folk music? And, and how do you imagine the future for for revival of, of that tradition? Great question. And the, through the, I'll, I'll step back a little bit and say that during the Russian imperial times, which is 1801 to 1917, the folk music was not suppressed at all. So the, the challenges for folk music in that period were what I mentioned before, urbanization. So a lot of the folk songs had to do with the context. If you, you, there's a whole repertory of songs for uh, uh, threshing and for haying and for, um, you know, group work activity. There are these, the whole genre called naduri of these kinds of work songs, hauling logs, you know, people depended on firewood. So they had to go up steep mountain slopes, cut logs. They had to move it themselves manually with the group. And to do that, they they used they synchronized their efforts with singing, not unlike many other uh, musical traditions around the world, where there were similar work songs, including in in America. And um, as people moved to the cities and started working in factories, of course, they didn't need these songs anymore. They stopped performing them. So there was a, a loss of context, which was one of the main challenges for the transmission of. Uh, folk music. So at the same time that 
uh, sacred music was being studied and written down in the uh, 1880s when it was when it really picked up. At the same time, there were a few ethnomusicologists who turned their attention to preserving folk music, folk poetry, martial arts, uh, folk dance, basically all of these rural traditions, which were increasingly under threat because people were leaving the villages and they just they, the traditions were being lost in an urban context where communities were not as tightly bound and didn't rely so much on, on culture to keep themselves uh, together. Uh, we all know that the city environment creates different cultural contexts. So we have some um, collections of notation of folk music from the 1880s, 90s, and the first second of the 20th century. And we have lots of books of folk poetry, which was written down by those same ethnographers and um, some books of dance steps and other such interesting works, costumes that, you know, all the embroidery traditions, even a few cookbooks, which were uh, collected at that time of local recipes from mountain regions. So um, in the 20th century, the major challenge under the Soviets was that the Soviets decided to professionalize folk music. So what you get is this professionalized version of these incredible singers, the best singers, and now they're paid and they're dressed and they have a certain number of singers and they're on stage and they're doing what they're told to do. And they do it every single day and they're absolutely phenomenal at this, okay? And the, I'm talking about the state ensembles, not just Georgia, but every single republic in the Soviet Union. And it wasn't just singers, it was also instrumentalists. And the Soviets had this thing where they would take one lute, some kind of folk instrument, and then they would treat it like a violin and, and make it larger and larger until they could have a string orchestra of that instrument. So instead of a violin in the Georgian context, there was a, a, a lute called the panduri. So we have the normal panduri, which is uh, two feet long, like a violin. And then they created five different sizes of panduri, and there would be a, a, an ensemble of 20 people playing this like string orchestra of panduris, okay? So this is, uh, you know, in retrospect, a little strange for us. Uh, it's not homegrown, so to speak. It was definitely a created repertory, but it was entertaining uh, and it was professionalized. Mm, so what it did is it, it helped support folk music to some degree, but it also suppressed other types of natural processes that happen when folk music is sung by folk, by real people in real contexts. Now, if you wanted to be a folk singer, you you imagined as a young child singing like those singers that you saw on the stage uh, at the local festival or when radio came in that you heard on the radio or television that you saw on the television. And it was no longer how grandma's singing or how grandpa's singing or how my buddies and I are singing or how I'm singing in the fields as I do this manual labor uh, or this historical ballad that I'm gonna sing uh, to my children over the long winter nights. And there, there were thousands and thousands of folk songs because it accompanied every walk of life. Morning songs, marriage songs, traveling, horseback riding songs, uh, lullabies, healing songs for the sick children, thousands of these kinds of songs, which we, uh, there has been a revival of them now in the post-Soviet period, but a lot of it has been from those early recordings in the pre-Soviet era. Uh, by the English Gramophone Company and others. Those collections of transcriptions, which were uh, recorded starting in the 1880s, and from families that managed to preserve the, folk, the oral tradition of folk music in, intact in their family strains, like those people I mentioned in Guria, who in the 1930s learned some chants by listening under the door when their parents were singing in secret. Mm -hmm. They maintained an oral tradition in their families throughout the Soviet Union that's a separate stream from the professionalized paid music of the local culture ministry. So that so folk music is equally fascinating and has an equally interesting transmission history uh, with, with definite chapters which parallel the transmission of sacred music. Uh, but one can say that it had different challenges than the sacred tradition and, and therefore different results. 
There, mm -hmm. there are far more folk songs that are available to us today, far uh, a much more diverse performance practice and, and, and different harmonies from different regions. And, uh, and Georgians take this very seriously. And it's a very important part of their identity to know the different folk musics from the different regions. And especially in the, in the post-Soviet era, as it's become less professionalized, people are starting to sing it again as folk music. And I think that's real progress. Mm -hmm. That's great. And you know, one thing that we notice in uh, some of the concerts that you've helped us facilitate, uh, especially the, the Ranina uh, Quartet concert, which is the one to which this interview is linked, um, that there's also this third genre, right? There's the urban songs alongside the traditional chants and the folk songs, um, and that a lot of groups are sort of performing them in the same context. But in, in Georgia, do, do these different genres appeal to, to different people, or are they, are they sort of all available to all singers? Um, and do you think Georgians might have a different perspective from, from the global audience uh, there uh, on that question? Right. So the Ranina Ensemble, the quartet, they're just such good singers. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be around them and to, to be friends with them. And uh, I've known several, several of the members for years and years now, 15, 16 years. Uh, and the, the other genre that you're referring to that we featured in the video are the so-called urban songs or Kalakuri in Georgian. And these are... Um, this is a combination of Italian art songs that came in in the late 19th century and melded with Georgian nationalist poetry and love poetry, but sung by Georgian fantastic singers. So it's it's more chromatic. It has more Italianate style harmony, but it also has a lot of Georgian influences. And this became the, the most popular genre there at the turn of the century among um, the, a more educated class. So uh, a class of Georgians who had access to uh, Western music, like the opera house, the theater, uh, the, the, the new uh, symphony orchestras and choirs that were emerging in the late Tsarist empire. But it, it, it quickly took off and became a salon genre that Georgians would sing uh, in, in their private homes at private events. And, um, uh, alongside imported uh, European arias and, and, and lida and other, you know, professional music as one would find in salons in Europe. So uh, to this day, this repertory of Kalakuri is very popular and it's what one would most likely hear in uh, a household if you were invited for dinner or so forth. So my wife comes from a singing family, both her parents sing, and what do they sing? They sing this Kalakuri genre. <laughs> they'll sing it a cappella, they'll sing it with a guitar, they'll sing it on a piano. Other family members, you could sing it with an accordion. Uh, so it goes, you can accompany or you can sing a cappella, and it's fun, and the, the texts are deeply embedded in Georgian society. They're written by the most famous poets, Akakatsereteria, Ilya Chavchavadze, you know, these, these great poets from the late 19th century. It's their texts that are set to these, uh, these kind of Italianate style songs. So your question is, how do Georgians perceive all these genres? Which did they prefer? Um, is, are there different segments of the population that like this or that? Of course there are. There's so much diversity. And, and now with the uh, you know, with social media, uh, globalization is just in full effect. And you, you have all different kinds of music in Georgia. Georgians, like everyone in the world, are musical people. You have, uh, there's a friend of mine is a, a, a Western country singer, like Texas country music. And he sings it with a Texas drawl. Uh, we have hip hop ensembles here. We have trance. Uh, we have every type of genre. You have uh, Georgian ensembles singing Corsican music or South African music, you know, not just uh, other sort of modern genres or popular genres. You have Georgians studying the folklore of other countries. Mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah, you know, so that's a, it's a full marketplace now and, and Georgians as musical people take advantage. But if you ask, if you were to take a poll of all Georgians and what's their favorite music, I think Kalakuri, this urban genre uh, of, of songs that come from the 1870s and 1880s and, and 
have and continue to be composed to this day. Every year, there are a number of ensembles that have a new arrangement of a famous text, or they have a brand new Kalakuri song to introduce to sing alongside the old favorites. Think of it like a barbershop uh, genre that didn't get calcified and stuck in its 1940s or 50s you know, position. Uh, but continue to evolve and, and remain relevant uh, to a broad segment of society. I love Barbershop Quartet, but it's really been pigeonholed or stuck in one place, and it, it's difficult to evolve, whereas this uh, Georgian genre continues to evolve and become popular, and you, you see it on television all the time. And like a New Year's uh, television segment for the main television stations, they brought out ensembles like the Ranina Quartet to perform the old favorites. Great. It's, it's so beautiful. I mean, it's just beautiful stuff. And it's, um, I mean, it's so romantic. And it's, it's got so much, it's got this combination of joy and longing in it that yeah. feels very Georgian. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's beautiful stuff. So I, I think we're getting to the end of our time. Um, so for, for one last question, just because uh, this is, of course, linked to the Ranina uh, Ensemble's video, um, and you were you participated in that video. So um, what was that experience like? Just just fill us in on, on uh, what you did there and, and how you were part of that experience. Well, it was a privilege to, to put together the show we were invited. Uh, by Thea and the team from the Library of Congress to put together this video, considering the, that the pandemic didn't allow for live performances. So first we had a brainstorming session, you know, what, what's, how can we best represent Georgian music? Should we focus on one genre? Should we focus on one region and perform sacred and folk and Kalakuri just from say a Tbilisi region? Or should we try and do a bit of everything and and how are we going to present that visually because these guys are excellent singers uh musically i had no question that the, it was going to be phenomenal and i was right when we did the the filming of this we never had to do a second take for musical reasons wow they are so good they every yeah. single thing you saw there is first take wow. uh but the you know the videography the cinematography we were filming in winter uh that was presented a lot more uh, challenges so we decided on the the three genres uh i put together the program and proposed it together with with the quartet members and i said uh let's put it in uh Let's separate the three genres. We'll film in three separate locations, which are emblematic of those genres or symbolic in some way. And, uh, and we'll have different costumes as well. And, um, and I think that will give the audience a quick snapshot into Georgian singing culture. So of course, the churches are so visually vibrant with the frescoes and the, the acoustics are fantastic. And normally uh, chanters would be singing investments, but we had the, uh, the traditional outfit, the chocha. So we just wore that in the churches mm -hmm. as well. And that looked good. Uh, for the folk music segment, we decided to sing outside because a lot of folk music was sung outside. Uh, and it was sung in, in yards or in the fields or on horseback, or et cetera. So that was a good place. And, and we sung folk songs from the kind of joking genres, love genres and, and uh, entertainment songs that one would sing with friends while having a, a snack or a meal on the, on the side of the road. And so that was the kind of ambiance that we tried to create there. And then for the city songs, um, a lot of times they happen on stage, but I prefer when they happen in the in the context of the home around the meal. So I said, is there any way we could film this in a home? How can we how can we put that together? OK, if we're going to be in the house and we need to be in regular clothes, we need to we need to have food on the table. Uh, and we so we just put on a supra, which is a traditional feast. We had the wine out. We made the toast and we had two videographers there with different angles and they just filmed for five hours. Uh, and then later we spent a week in the editing room uh, picking the best bits and pieces and trying to put it together. But it was a, it was a lot of footage that went into to creating that uh, short little 
snapshot of the Ranina Quartet. And we were pleased with the way it came out, despite some some videographic and cinematographic uh, challenges that, that came along. No, we think it was beautiful. It was great. And definitely the best snacks of any homegrown video. Oh, my God. <laughs> Everyone was so hungry. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Then I tried to, you know, my I didn't want to take up any time. Away. I didn't want to take any time away from the singing. Uh, no, the singing is, is what we should listen to. But sometimes for an audience that's not used to Georgian music, uh, the, all the singing will start to blend together and, and, and you won't necessarily know what you're listening to. So I think it does help to have a little bit of context, like at least the, the, the theme of the song, the genre, maybe where it was sung or, or in what kind, you know, these types of things. So I tried to just insert a little bit of commentary, but I asked the videographers to cut out most of the things that I said. And, and <laughs> I think that we, we tried to maximize the singing as much as possible. Well, we're glad that we that we had what we did have of you introducing things because I think it really does enhance people's understanding. As you say, otherwise it would all kind of blend together and it's good to to have some perspective on all that. So, John, uh, we just want to thank you so much for your participation in the concert and also in this interview. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been great. Thank you so much.